Good morning and welcome to Holy Trinity Presbyterian Church. We are delighted that you could be with us today and worship here for the third Sunday of Advent. My heavens, where has the time gone? But here we are on the third Sunday of Advent. I do have some announcements I'd like to share with you. If you are watching this before Sunday morning, just so you know, immediately after the drive-in worship on this Sunday, uh, about 10.30 in the morning, we will be holding our annual congregational meeting. This is an important meeting, and while we cannot hold it inside due to the COVID, we will be holding it as a drive-in meeting outside. So as long as you get to the church by 10.30, or a little bit before 10.30 a.m. Uh, today, you will then be able to join us at our annual meeting. We're gonna be electing the elders and the deacons for the next terms. We're also voting to reduce the, the time frame on those terms from three to two years. Just makes it a lot easier on folks to serve two two-year terms potentially as to opposed to potentially two three-year terms. Um, you'll also be approving my terms of call, my compensation package, if you will, for the next year. It is the same as 2020. Nothing has changed, so no pay raises or anything, so it's kind of black and white. Uh, and, and also in there, we have to have the legal corporate meeting. I anticipate a fairly short meeting, but if you're able to, we'd love to have you join us. You could come in your car and you can vote by beeping and there'll be ways for you to speak, I suspect. And similarly, we, do, we have sent out links to the members of the church so that you can join us via Zoom online. Not sure exactly how well that'll work because we will be outside under the portico share, but it appears to be working fine and we're gonna give it a try. Uh, we want to include you as best as we can. Tomorrow, we will be having a food drive, a Christmas food drive between 9 and 12 p.m., 9 a.m. and 12 p.m., non-perishable foods only. This food will go down to All Souls Episcopal Church, to their food pantry, which is part of the Harry Chapin Food Bank. We're a partner in that ministry down there. So we would love to, to share whatever you're able to bring in. Again, non-perishable foods only. We are also collecting new or gently used shoes that will be donated to Immokalee, to Mission Peniel, to the farm worker community out there. So if you are able to do that, again, you could drop those off tomorrow between 9 and 12. Now next week, next Sunday, we are going to kind of sort of have a Christmas dinner. Uh, I know we can't get together. Oh, we'd love to be in the fellowship hall. We cannot do that. But what we're going to do is after the drive-in worship, the drive-in's at 930, as soon as that is over, we're going to sing some Christmas carols. 10 or 15 minutes worth, you can sit in your car, you can get out of your car and join us, however it works for you. Sing uh, Christmas carols for a few minutes, then you can pick up a boxed dinner from Anthony's. It'll be a lasagna dinner, it's gonna cost $10. Uh, and then you could take it home, and even though we're not together symbolically, we're all eating lunch together, or Christmas dinner, if you will, together. So if you're interested in doing that, please sign up. You can do it through your Realm account, the church membership program. You can also call the church office or drop us an email. The cost is $10 per box. So please consider doing that. Uh, it promises to be a good time. Lastly, Christmas Eve is not far away, only a week and a half away. We will hold one celebration of worship on Christmas Eve. We will also have something online as well. But for drive-in or for the in-person worship, we will have a drive-in worship at 4 p.m. Session chose 4 p.m. for many reasons, not the least of which is many in our congregation are older. Our average age is about 80. So what we are going to do is, is allow you the ability to get home before it is really, really dark outside. So that is going to be on Christmas Eve, one worship service at 4 p.m. as a drive-in worship. We invite you to come and join us for that. But right now, friends, it's a great day to be alive and a great day to worship God, especially on this third Sunday of Advent. Let us now be about the spirit of worship.
Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in, a, in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all peoples shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the third week of Advent. We move to the third verse of our song. In the midst of a bleak midwinter, angels and all creation came to worship the birth of a child in a manger. In the dark winter, God had sent a gift to the world, bringing light, truly someone deserving worship. As we light our third candle, the candle of joy, like those angels of 2,000 years ago, we come to worship the Christ child. May the joy that comes from knowing Christ lead us in our worship today and in the days that lie ahead. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Let us continue now in a time of silent prayer and confession before our Lord. Hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners just like us. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, let us pray together. Gracious and loving God, as we are marching our way through Advent, open our whole being that we may hear the word that you bring to us today in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We are continuing in our year of the Bible reading now into one of the 12 minor prophets, Micah, reading chapter 5, starting at verse 2. Listen for the words of the Lord. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clan of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are of old from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord is God. And they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And he will be our peace when the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortresses. We will raise against them seven shepherds, even eight commanders. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, may we pray together. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight this day and indeed every day. Amen. One of the most beautiful places I have ever visited is Montreat, North Carolina. Montreat, North Carolina is home to a, a camp, a conference center, a retreat center for the Presbyterian Church. It was very big with the Southern Church before the Northern and Southern Churches merged. There's a, a magnificent college there. 
Bond Street's also home to the Billy Graham family. Obviously, Billy and Ruth are gone, but Ruth used to attend the Presbyterian churches where she grew up in Montreat, North Carolina. And, and as you make your way into Montreat, up on top of the hill is where Billy Graham's place is now, Franklin's. Up there, it's, it's absolutely magnificent. But there is just something special when you go to Montreat. For some reason, somehow, some way, you just feel closer to God. Writers call it a thin place, T-H-I-N, a thin place. That it is a place where somehow you, you just feel closer to the Lord. Uh, there is an island off of the coast of Scotland known as Iona. And it is considered to be one of the thin places where when people go there, they just for some reason or other have this feeling that they are closer to God. St. Columba felt that it was so powerful that he actually established a monastery that is there to this day. It is magnificent. Most people would say that heaven and earth are very far apart but yet, the Celts, the, the ones who St. Columba was ministering to, would disagree with that. They would talk about heaven and earth only being feet apart, being very, very close. That it, it is a thin spot where heaven and earth are near each other. And John the Baptist and Jesus Christ himself even talked about the kingdom of hand, uh, heaven being at hand that heaven can be right here with us, or at least a foretaste of heaven can begin right here on earth. In the last century, a monk by the name of Thomas Merton, a really wonderful man, used to write about that there are thin places all around us. They are everywhere. That we are this close to God so often, but yet the distractions of the world keep us from feeling and seeing and, and experiencing this closeness to God. Like people walking around and staring at their cell phones while they miss a magnificent sunset or their grandchildren playing on a playset, or the smile of their aging spouse. We can be distracted and miss something magnificent right before our eyes. A number of years ago, Amy and I and a church group had gone over to the Holy Lands. I think for me, Mount Sinai was a thin place, not just because the air was thin, but because we felt close to God. The Jordan River, possibly at the exact site where Jesus was baptized on the Jordan side, felt very special. Caesarea Philippi felt very special who do you say that I am? Very important place and so gorgeous. Shepherd's Field, where the shepherds heard the announcement. Very thin. But nothing compared to Bethlehem. As you make your way to the place where Jesus well could have been born, we don't know for sure, you walk through Bethlehem and there are Palestinians, Arabs, and Christians selling all kinds of stuff. Hordes and hordes of crowds with people hawking their wares and some of them not being very nice about it. There is a reason there's a term Arab trader. Oh my, they could have pressure. And of course, there were the pilgrims coming to Bethlehem. As we entered the church where Christ is believed to have been born, it was just crammed with people. And they were selling things even at the entrance of the church, trinkets, stuff to buy. But we made our way to a cave of which there are hundreds in Bethlehem. And we don't know exactly where Jesus was born. It could have been this one, could have been another one. But what I do know is this. We walked into this wonderful space that had an altar, a preparation table there where you could serve communion. It had a manger that was 2,000 years old, cut out of the stone. But as we stood in that place, 
something felt weird. The hair on the back of our necks all stood up. And suddenly we realized we were in a very thin place. The guy that I was with, a wonderful Palestinian Christian, just whispered into my ear, Silent Night. So I began singing a cappella Silent Night. The others began to sing with me. And the next thing you know, I look around the room and 20 some of us are all crying. Because for that moment, we had experienced a thin place. For a moment, we felt very close to God. Micah tells us that this tiny little town of Bethlehem, this small town that is really nothing, will bring forth the ruler over Israel, will shepherd, and the people will live securely, he says. This tiny little insignificant town will have greatness. And that this person, this shepherd, will be our Think about it for a moment. What makes a city or a town great? When we think about the great cities of the United States or the great cities of the world, it might be because of their commerce. It might be because of the wealth of the city. Maybe entertainment like in New York City on Broadway or, or perhaps Orlando. It might be because of their sports team. Maybe their location on rivers or ports. Perhaps their power in the form of their seats of government. The reality is Bethlehem had none of that. Bethlehem is a nowhere town. It was really a rural place that had shepherds and flocks of sheep. The town is a dry town. I don't mean with alcohol. It is a dry town, there's no water. So they live for the most part off of cisterns, the water they would catch from the rainy season. It was a poor area, largely landless because of the shepherds. It was a no place. But yet out of this city would come King David, who would rule Israel and Judah. Later, Later would come the birth of none other than Jesus Christ himself. From the least of the cities of Israel and Judah would come the King David and subsequently our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it is very fitting that in referring to Bethlehem that Jesus will be referred to as a shepherd shepherding his people. You see, that's what Bethlehem was, and even still is. They still have sheep in Bethlehem today. But what this message of Micah is saying is that we will have one shepherd, one shepherd to lead us. The story of the entire Bible, for those of you that are doing Year of the Bible, you've seen it over and over again. God is saying that we must have only one God, that we can only have one shepherd in our lives. I've already said in, your, in the time I've been here at Holy Trinity, I am not your shepherd. Some people will refer to me as the pastor, as the shepherd of the, of the church. No, that's not the case. Jesus Christ is our shepherd. I am merely a sheepdog trying to lead people to the shepherd. We have but one shepherd, and his name is Christ Jesus. But when we follow that shepherd, what do we have? Right now in our world, we want security and peace. Just a week ago, right in my neighborhood, which is a fairly safe neighborhood in a good area, I mean, nice area, it, is, it, it's, it doesn't have uh, gates or whatnot, it's open, there are no guards. It's not a gated community, but yet largely it's safe. We've had a series of cars broken into. So far, we've been blessed with no houses, but it's terrifying. You, we be, become afraid. We want security and peace. So what do we do? We put locks on our houses. We make sure we lock our car. 
Maybe we install security systems. Perhaps we put in impact windows, like uh, to prevent the, the danger of a hurricane. And by the way, they also help protect us from break-ins. Try throwing a rock or a brick through an impact window. Good luck on that one. We put in impact doors. But yet, if a thief wants in, my friends, if a thief wants in, they're going to get in. If a Category 5 storm comes and we've put on impact windows and we have the, the great roofs and done everything right, but if a Category 5 throws off a tornado that hits a direct strike on our houses, that Category 5 with a tornado, it's going to get in. Some people think the security comes with money. After all, cash is king, isn't it? Do any of you remember 1929? Some of us in this congregation are old enough. And for those who aren't, do it, did any of you study what happened in Argentina with the hyperinflation that they had and devaluation of a currency? Cash can literally lose its value overnight. Some would say, we have security in our president, in our Congress, and in our military. They can protect us and nothing could ever happen to the United States of America. Most of us are old enough to remember what happened to the Soviet Union. Who would have ever dreamed that we would see the equivalent of the capital of the United States, but in this case in the Soviet Union, get shot at with tanks and see the Soviet Union collapse and fall apart? now Ukraine, Lithuania, and Russia, as well as elsewhere. Micah, I think, reminds us, Revelation certainly does, that if we put our faith and our trust in this world, we will not have security and peace. True security and peace come from that thin place between us and God, that thin space where God is present in our lives, Initially, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, but later on, when we are actually face to face. Security and peace come from being with God. So, we are in Advent. Perhaps, just perhaps, every year, temporally, in a time, you and I have the opportunity to experience a thin place in time. A thin place. Perhaps, just perhaps, Advent and Christmas can be an opportunity for us to be this close to God and feel the presence, the love, the safety, security, and peace that comes from God from the very Prince of Peace himself. But my dear friends, we can miss that thin place right now. We can miss it in Advent and Christmas so easily. How? Perhaps we become so distracted by the season that we're our decorating, our shopping, our, our baking, our travel becomes more and more important to the point where it distracts us from the reason for the season. Did we buy the right gift? Was it too expensive? Was it not expensive enough? Was it something meaningful? Oh, crud, did you see the gift they bought us? And ours was only worth one-fourth the cost? Oh, what are we going to do? One of my favorite comedies was on the Big Bang when Penny and Sheldon are exchanging gifts. And Sheldon is terrified because he knows that he has to match whatever gift Penny has bought him in value and worth. So what does Sheldon do? I think he goes to a bed, bath, and beyond, and he buys a series of gifts, cheaper one, a little more expensive, a little more expensive, and he says, I can always take them back. So he buys hundreds of dollars worth of gifts, and he puts them into his, his bedroom, so that when Penny gives him his gift, he can go in the other room and get her the appropriate gift for her, matching her in value. 
she apologizes that she does not have a particularly great gift for him. But she mentions to him that Leonard Nimoy had come into her restaurant. And while he was there, Leonard Nimoy being Spock on Star Trek, Leonard Nimoy is there. She asked him if he would be kind enough to give him a, an autograph for Sheldon. So he does. He autographs his napkin to Sheldon. Leonard Nimoy lived long and prosper. The only thing she said, but I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry, Sheldon. He's, he's, he's taken his napkin and he wiped his face with it so it's not even a clean napkin. Meanwhile, Sheldon is collapsing on the floor. He realizes he has an autograph from his greatest all-time hero, Leonard Nimoy. And then he goes on to remark, I even have his DNA from what he wiped off of his face. We could clone Leonard Nimoy. How can I ever repay you for the gifts? And what's he do? He goes into his bedroom. He brings every gift that he had bought for Penny and hands them to her. And then he realizes that's not enough. And Sheldon gives her a hug. The problem is, you and I, can become so much like that Sheldon character. We can become like the rest of the world. We get so worked up in the stuff of Advent and Christmas. We fail to recognize that this is a very thin place where you and I can be drawn closer to the Lord, to the baby born in a manger, and to the baby who will return once again as a risen Lord and Savior. Perhaps, just perhaps, this year, we can grow closer to Christ. Bethlehem itself meant nothing. It was truly nowhere. It was a no place. But God used Bethlehem to perform a miracle. We may look at North Fort Myers or wherever you live and say it's a no place. We might look at our lives and think that we are largely insignificant. But God can use anyone, anywhere, any place to do remarkable things. Look what he did in Bethlehem. But who is our shepherd? Is Christ alone our shepherd? Or are we being led by other shepherds in this world? Follow Jesus Christ. And if you do, know the true security and peace that comes by living in a very thin place. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand when you and I have Christ in our hearts. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith, which this morning is the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This third Sunday of Advent, we have many joys as well as concerns. If you have any joys or concerns that you would like to share with your church family, please do not hesitate to call us, to drop us an email, and we will be certain to include them here online as well as in our drive-in live worship service. Friends, we do have many things to be thankful for, but also some concerns. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this Sunday and for those who have agreed to be elders and deacons for the coming years. Lord, thank you for your servants who continue to love and serve you day in and day out. Lord God, we pray for servants in the form of healthcare workers, for researchers, 
for folks that are distributing vaccines across our country. We pray that you would be with all of them and keep them safe. Lord God, we continue to pray for all who are sick, for those who have lost loved ones. And we pray particularly for our young men and women in uniform, wherever they may be, here or deployed somewhere across the world. Protect them and keep them safe, we pray. But God, there are some people we do know of. So we raise up to you, Bob and Elaine Nell, Judy and Chuck Chase, Larry Trotter, Paula, Cecilia, and Una, the Wolcott family, Joanne and Freddie, Ron, Byron, and Bev, Dave and Jim, Wendell, Terry, Betsy, and Billy, Ames, Reagan, and Dave, Doris and Sharon, Bev, Scott, Linda Schmidt's brother-in-law, the Donaldson family, anyone else that is known only in the whispers of our hearts, hear our prayers. Now, Lord God, hear our prayers. We say the words Christ Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare for Christmas Day, many of us are very concerned about our gifts and what we are going to buy to give to those whom we love or make for those whom we love. Where does gift giving come from? Well, I think a great extent you could say it comes from the Magi and the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But the reality is God gave us the greatest gift of all in the form of his son, Christ Jesus. As we prepare to bring forth our tithes and our offerings, our gifts to do the Lord's work, I invite you to think about how the Lord has blessed you, how the Lord has been active in your life, and how you can bring a gift this morning. Online, you certainly can mail in your checks to us. Thank you. We appreciate that very much. You've been so faithful over the year. Thank you. Uh, please don't mail cash. That's always dangerous. But even checks. We've had checks get stolen over the last year out of the mail. It's just, I mean, it's the mail system. Somebody could take them. It's hard for them to cash them. But they can still steal them. The safest way, the quickest way, and the one that really does help the church the most is if you, if you do it online. Go to htpc-nfm.com. You can also go to our, our emails. You can see in there how you can donate, even through your cell phone. It is safe, it is instantaneous, and there's no worry about the money getting stolen in the mail somewhere along the way. But however you choose to give, thank you. Thank you for the gifts that you are giving us. Let us bring forth our tithes and our offerings. May we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the greatest gift of all the gift of your Son, Christ Jesus. Lord God, be in our lives. Help us to see the gifts that you have given to us and then accept these gifts that we have given to you. Help the leaders of the church to use them wisely to do your will, not ours, but help each and every one of us to use not just the gifts of our money, but the gifts of our time and our talent as we seek to share the love of Christ with those who are around us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, as you go out into the world this week, making our march towards Christmas Day, I pray that you are able to find a thin place, that you may be drawn closer to the very presence of God in your life, that you will truly experience the security and peace of God that comes from having Christ as our Lord and Savior. But until we meet again, receive the benediction. Now may the grace of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. The Lord be with you. And 
have a wonderful week.